How do you know if your house is insured for the right amount? Uh, say your home burnt down, as hundreds of houses actually did in 2020, would your insurance cover be enough to replace it? Here's a bigger question. What is the extent of underinsurance in Australia? We have the answer today and it's going to shock you. I mean, there are people still living in camper trailers and caravans and tents from the fires of last Christmas, a year later, because they still aren't able to get a full assessment on their property. So if we're now adding 30 months before you're back into your home, what would it cost then? Welcome to The Elephant in the Room. This is the podcast where we love to talk about the big things in property that never usually get talked about. I'm Veronica Morgan, real estate agent, buyer's agent, co-host of Foxtel's Location, Location, Location Australia and author of Auction Ready. And I'm Chris Bates, mortgage broker. Before we get started, I need to let you know that nothing we say on here can be taken as personal advice. We always recommend you engage the services of a professional. Don't forget that you can access the transcript for this episode on the website as well as down Download our free full or forecast report. Which experts can you trust to get it right? The elephant in the room.com.au. Today we're tackling a particularly big elephant. I know from personal experience how hard it is to arrive at the appropriate amount to insure your house for. You can ask the insurance company, but you'll get nowhere as they disclaim their way out of giving you advice. Now, at least I've got somewhat of an idea of bill costs because I've renovated, but I can still feel the pull to underinsure in order to keep the premium down. The bushfires of the past year have put underinsurance into the spotlight and we've been keen to discuss this topic for some time. And today we're joined by an expert in what it costs to build a building. He also happens to know a bit about flammable cladding and apartment build quality, so we're in for an interesting conversation. Marty Sadlier is the co-founder and director of MCG Quantity Surveyors and he started out life as a chippy, that's a carpenter, before actually becoming a quantity surveyor and we're going to explain what exactly a quantity surveyor is coming up. Marty's also a property investor himself and he does have a passion in ensuring that developers and property owners and investors alike do gain a comprehensive understanding of construction costs, all of them, and potential risks. Thanks for joining us today, Marty. Thanks so much for having me. Marty, so good to have you on. In a property sense, exactly how underinsured is Australia? Look, the the current stats from last year uh, is that it currently sits at 83% of Australians are underinsured. Um, gong, what? Yeah, yeah, it's, it's big. It um, and it's been that way for a long time. Uh, you know, in two thousand and four, uh, the Australian Securities and Investment Commission did their first uh, survey on the back of the ACT bushfires, and they found that eighty one percent of people were underinsured, and the number hasn't changed right through to two thousand and twenty, being the last uh, research paper on it. And so, I guess you know, when they're actually researching actually people who have actually claimed on their insurance, then that's pretty real data, isn't it? As opposed to, you know, the boffins getting in and just just applying some mathematics. 81% yeah. actually lost their houses and didn't have enough money yep. to cover. Yeah, that's mm-hmm. right. And mm-hmm. and I think the, the real alarm bells for me is that, A, that number is massive. Like if you're comparing that to anything else in society, if something was at 83%, it's well past epidemic, pandemic, um, you know, everything's sort of at a loss. Now, it, you know, there was an attitude of if it's not broke, Well, actually, sorry, it. on that, we'd actually have herd immunity if we had 80, 81% of people. Correct. Yeah. <laughs> no, and, that is significant. Yeah, and it's staggering that, you know, the crazy number I haven't even actually said yet, and that is, is that the ABS last year came out on the back of census and, and different surveys that, 1.8 million Australians don't have house or contents insurance at all. That's 23% of Australian homes don't have uh, property insurance at all. Now, that doesn't exclude cool. mortgages. And I kind of think, hang on a minute, to have a mortgage that you have to have insurance. So who are not dotting I's and crossing T's here? It's a very good point, actually. Mm. So when we do a loan... Uh, a client needs to provide a certificate of currency um, yep. for that loan to settle. Yep. But it's not something that's provided on an annual basis. It's not. Uh, so even and even if it's 
Mm. The certificate of currency, if you cancel that policy after a week, the bank doesn't really check on you. So it's not like a green slip with a car. You can't register your car unless you've got your green slip. Yeah. Um, and, uh, yeah, so it is a huge problem where people can say, oh, our times are a bit tough. Do we really need it? It's a bit expensive where we are because of flood or fire or something. Let's just get rid of that and hopefully no one asks. Yeah, and, you know, the, the there's a, a good part of, like, the data in regards to who makes up that sort of percentage of people that don't have any insurance at all. Um, and the ABS go into that in a lot more detail. And it's things like... Um, you know, non-insurance is closely correlated to um, demographic uh, variables uh, like the age uh, of the person, their location, their education, their country of birth. So they sort of found that in their report that non-insurance trends and uh, it tends to be associated with those that are either at their earlier stages of their lives, living in cities um, or particular cities, born in non-Western countries, uh, with lower levels of education or without full-time work, which kind of supports, I can't afford it, so I won't do it. I'm surprised I can afford a house. Yeah. You know, if they're in that dem- in that situation, particularly with non-full-time work. Yeah. It's rather alarming. They certainly can't afford to have it burned down. Well, and I guess that that's kind of the, the point for me, that it's potentially the people that are the most vulnerable mm. yeah. that don't have it. Mm. And, of course, insurance, you know, it's it's not food on the table, is it? It's the bill that you, you sort of put your head in the sand and hope that you never need to, to call on. Yeah. But that That is really a, it's a very interesting point and also the very interesting point about the obligation of, of um, a mortgage or I always get it confused. The person paying the mortgage, are they the mortgagee or the mortgagee? Uh, the mortgagee is the person Sorry. paying. Um, Thank you. The mortgagee. Yeah. <laughs> So the obligation on the mortgagee to actually insure the property, and you sign a contract at the beginning when you take out that mortgage. Yeah. Uh, I'm presuming that's in there somewhere, is it, Chris, the, you know, the obligation to actually insure the property, um, and the, and yet they're not doing it. They potentially don't even realise that they have to do it. Well, at 83% under insurance, now the definition of under insurance is that a property is insured for 90% or less of its value. Uh, if... of Australians are underinsured and 23% of Australians don't have any insurance at all, there's someone not ticking a duty of care box. In actual fact, there are multiple people not ticking a duty of care box. And I'm not talking about the end user. I'm talking about banks and making sure that that's in play. Uh, you know, an insurance broker making sure they're, you know, I mean, an insurance broker will say to me, oh, that's not our problem. It's they've, they've got to get the insurance. Well, you know, who's getting the phone call at the end? Who's taking money for a service? Mm. Mm. Although how many insure? I mean, that might be a block of apartments would have an insurance broker. Correct. But most individual uh, uh, house owners don't have a broker. And as I said I, in the intro, I mean, I know myself, um, and I get asked the question by my clients, how, well, how do we know what we should be insuring the property for? Now, yeah. okay, so most people have got no idea what it will cost to replace their house. No. And, you know, as I said, I just recently did a complete renovation, so I got a very good idea on what it will cost. But the actual money that I paid the builder wasn't it. There was more than that. There was all the the consultancy fees to get to that point, council fees, you know, there's there's uh, – bunch of incidentals that landscaping even wasn't covered yes. um you know so how how do most people work out how much they should insure their house for look quite cynically i guess um people take advice off someone they used to know that used to catch up with a guy down the pub who knew someone who was a builder type mm. scenario and and that's that's kind of sad that in most cases the a person's home uh, will be their biggest asset and their research and priority um, to go into looking at what their potential risk is. Seems like people spend more time researching uh, the cost of a second TV for a spare Mm. bedroom. Um, And, you know, the priority that we get around that isn't there. Uh, And I guess that's the insurance world. They have a bad name. We're paying. It's not going to happen to me. Like the whole, you know, uh, illness type scenario. And it's very scary that people just take the advice of, of someone that or they do a quick search or read a paper and go, oh, I can build a new project home for X amount, that'll do. Um, But there's so much missing from that. There's just so much missing from that. So I think a lot of people come up with the amount for what they need to insure by is what the bank obligates them to insure. So 
you know, if, for example, you buy a place at, say, 1.5 million, they may value the land at, say, 900 and say that the house is or the building's worth 600. So, you know, but that, that valuation's done pretty quick. It's done maybe yeah. in 20, 20 or 30 minutes, Some if, if that, going to someone's house. Yeah. Um, they're not spending hours and hours really sort of doing a cost analysis of what it would be to replace today. Um, and so people are just taking that number and saying, well, that'll do. But, you know, obviously that's not good enough, Marty. No, it's not. And so if we just touch on that point, so if we're going to go down the road of a valuer, now valuers, I use valuers all the time. Valuers are, for, for, in my opinion, for their part that they play, cannot be replaced. But are we stepping or are they stepping out of their lane in that regard? I mean, you're, you're getting a valuer come around and do a, a property valuation. They're not looking at it from a cost to build. Uh, they're looking at it from a sales valuation point of view. So we know that valuers do replacement cost estimates on properties, but they'll have a disclaimer in their report saying, we can't stand by this use the services of a quantity surveyor, but they're still doing that sort of report. Now, they're looking at it, uh, applying a cost per square metre to a generic house. Um, yeah. you know, and you're there for 20 minutes. I mean, I don't understand how, you know, people are really happy with that from a, from that offering that it's still disclaimed out and it's just applying a cost. I mean, you, you need to look at various things, you know, the location of a property in regards to, you know, is there going to be transport issues? Are we going to be able to get materials in here? Yeah. You know, there's so many parameters that need to be applied uh, that it's it's really one of the main reasons we're looking at under insurance that, it, oh, we've got something. Yeah. <laughs> so you should be going more, though, than less, though. Obviously, it's a cost, but, you know, building prices change dramatically year to year. Yeah, they do. Um, I mean, we've seen that in in recent, you know, well, previous years. Sorry, with you know, steel prices, you know, exponentially changed in Australia virtually overnight. Sort of went up hundreds of percent dearer, um, and then you know, suddenly, uh, steel was then coming in from India, or you know, just changes in world markets. You'll see certain materials change, and with innovation, you know, like so, you'll start to see new building products come onto the market that then for a little while. You know, you may pay for that because, A, there's not much competition from an installer's point of view. Yeah. People need to learn the product. So there are different things why things change. Um, and, you know, there are certain building materials you cannot use anymore. You know, asbestos, you know, is one of them. So you know, <laughs> there, there are certain things that need to be applied uh, when you're looking at at that. Now, you know, if you're looking at in replacement cost estimate uh, value of a, a warehouse that has an asbestos roof, well, if that has fire damage, it's not just the replacement cost of the asbestos roof. I mean, that whole site now becomes contaminated. So, mm. you know, there, if you're looking at a replacement cost, it's not just look up the paper and get an idea of what it would, oh, I can get a warehouse built for this. Right. So, you know, the insurance companies, you know, they, they are very much, well, we can't advise you on this. You know, you have to make your own decision. And then they'll give you um, various tools like online calculators and stuff and yep. you sort of, oh, I've got a brick brick house, tile roof, you know, aluminium windows or whatever. Um, but it's all, you know, I wonder about that because, you know, you can plug all sorts of stuff into that and God knows what it spits out. And let's yep. face it, I wouldn't want to trust my rebuild to that. No. Um, are they helpful or are they just sort of a bit of a buck pass? Uh, look, they're they're a tool, um, and they can be um, give you a bit of a guide. But I wouldn't insure my house off it by any means. And I've done analysis of calculators in in two thousand and five. Atsic did a uh, a review of five construction cost calculators. Uh, I haven't seen an update on that, so I did my own last year. And you know the percentages, you know, from the large like. Well, here, here's the big problem with calculators. You're in a many cases trying to fit a square peg into a round hole because, yeah. and I, I say to people, look at it open, you know, click on one and do your own research. You know, go home and try and fit your own house into a cost calculator. You yeah. might only have three options to drop down from. Like it might be a single story house, a double story house, it might only have, a, you know, you might have a brick one. You've got to try and fit your property into that. And let's be honest, with architecturally designed homes, you know, they're all different. So to try and even allocate the right answer to a couple of the parameters you need to select from is kind of impossible. So 
um, you know, the calculators are inaccurate. And at the bottom of the ca calculator, before you click on it, whether you go onto all of the different insurance uh, companies or banks' websites, there is a disclaimer uh, that, you know, do not, you know, you can't sort of take this to the bank, so to speak. You, you need to do mm. your own research and get it independently assessed. So what are the main things you think that we need to be insured for, though? Like, obviously, fire is one, but what are some of the things that people aren't thinking about that, you know, can completely destroy their home uh, and leave a huge liability at the end of it? And that's the thing, right? If you have a house, say, worth 1.5, you've got a mortgage on it at 1.3, um, and it does burn down and you haven't got insurance, um, what have you left with? The land cost, if that, you know, yeah. still got to get rid of the house. Um and where does that, you know, where does that loss come from, right? You might, you know, how, land might only be worth five, six hundred thousand, and you've now owe seven hundred grand to the bank. Then you have to go bankrupt, etc. So, you know, what are the what are the main things people are forgetting when the importance of insurance? Yeah, look. So the, the big things for me are that as a, as know your climate. So if you're in the tropical north, you're going to be having you know, heavy rainfall mm. events, uh, cyclones, and the like, and you know. Uh, on the coastal areas, we get storms, we get high wind uh, and flooding type scenarios. Uh, and that's not to say that you know, the central west or the middle of Australia don't get the floods, but certainly the big things for me would be we have big fire seasons, which we've just gone through in the 1920 Christmas, um, and then we get big flooding events. We're in a La Nina at the moment. Um, you know, the rainfall, we've seen damage already. Uh, and then we have our alpine areas where we have snowfalls. But then you've also got, you could have electrical fault. Yeah, yeah. There, there, are, <laughs> there are plenty of places that a dodgy air conditioner or a dodgy iron or toaster have, have taken a house out. So, okay, so what's the answer? So an individual wants to insure their home, doesn't mm. want to underinsure. How do, how do they, A, know, that, know whether they're underinsuring or not? And, B, you know, the premiums, oh, God, I can't remember the other premium was like, three thousand dollars or something i mean you know yeah. it's it, it's like a lot of money and so then do i then go and pay a quantity surveyor what do you charge yeah so we, we, or something yeah, how, does it, how does it work so we do it at six hundred dollars uh, plus gst and we go out to the site uh and we'll do an assessment and we get the plans and, and we'll go through um the whole kit and caboodle on that and I'm that's sort of joking about that to be quite frank i didn't actually know you offered that as a yeah service. yeah well because i guess the the thing for us is, is that there is more than just the construction value um, that you need to sort of be insured for. Um, that, that's only really part of, of the puzzle. So when you're looking at property insurance, you also need to allow for demolition. So if you um, yeah. buy a block of land and build a house on it and you go, okay, I built that house for $400,000, so that's all I need to insure my property for. Well, no, because if your property burns down, you now need to get rid of all of that debris that wasn't there before when it was a greenfield site. So you're already underinsured. Um, the other thing is that you need to allow for all of the consultants and uh, all of the different soft costs that come along with that, with you know, mm. going back through councils and getting development approvals and planning approvals and, and the engineering that you may not have paid if you did it as a project home the first time. There might have been some sort of cost yep. in there. The other side of that too is that uh, you also have to allow for cost escalations. So if you build a house today and it, and it burns down tomorrow, you then have to allow for what other construction materials and labour are going to cost in the future because we're not clicking our fingers in a house erects itself tomorrow. Um, you know, it may be that we have to go three months through planning approval, another couple of months in getting uh, a, um, a drawn up with architects and, and the like, and then we might have to go and wait two or three months to get a builder uh, from a tender, and then it might be a nine-month build. So suddenly we're at 18 months before we're even stepping foot back in it. And that's not, I haven't even in any of this discussion even noted the time it takes for an insurance company to come out and do an assessment on that. I mean, there are people still living in camper trailers and caravans and tents from the fires of last Christmas, mm. a year later, because they still aren't able to get a full assessment on their property. So if we're now adding 30 months before you're back into your home, Mm. When you look at what is the replace, what do I need to insure my property for? I need to be looking at 
when, if it did burn down, when could I feasibly get back in? What would it cost then? Because that's what you're paying the builder, not now. Do you mind, right, is there any, I don't know actually the answer to this, is there any um, limits on how much you can insure your home for? Let's say you are being super conservative and you, you know, you say it's worth 600, but um, you want to insure it for a million. Well, insurers yeah. still allow you to sort of go that much above what it potentially costs. Yeah, just they to- will. I mean, they, they would they would probably be wanting to ask the question why and then hopefully they would be saying you need to get it independently done because they, they yeah. want to cover that risk. <laughs> so, <laughs> there they go. Because I'm going to burn my house down and I want to get a better one. Yeah, yeah, the fire sale. <laughs> so, yeah. But I guess that's the, the point, right, that, you'd need to speak to your insurer and get an understanding of, well, if my property is worth a thousand, a million dollars to replace and the premium I pay on that is 3,000, to add a hundred or $200,000 buffer, it may only change the premium by 50, $60. I mean, you'd need to run that scenario. Yeah, that's right. Is that the extra 300,000, you know, can make a huge difference well, yeah, yeah. If, mm. as we use that example where if your property is worth a million dollars and you only insure it for 80% of its value, so you only insure it for 800000 and then the, it burns down, the insurance company will say, hang on, you're underinsured, you were only prepared to cover the loss of 80%, so we're only going to pay you 80% of what you were prepared to insure it for. So you're now only going to get paid 80% of the 800000 So now you're already a few hundred thousand short of what you are going to get, what was the net benefit in that if you had just been paying an extra 20 bucks on your premium or an extra 50 bucks or hundred dollars on your premium per year as a risk factor? Like you might've been able to, in that instance, get another 20 years of payments and be, I mean, it just, are you it just doesn't make sense. But are you seriously saying though, that if, if the, if the insurance company says, well, actually, you've deliberately underinsured, so we're going to deliberately undercover you. Yeah, I mean- there are a couple of different scenarios there. There are two main insurance policies in Australia, which is the total uh, replacement value, and the other policy is usually the sums insured. So the sums insured is where you agree on a value, so you come up with that value. The total replacement is that they will cover the, whatever the total replacement cost is on a property. However, that is based on them building something similar to what you had. You don't right. have the input on on that. So if you had a four bedroom brick home before, they're just going to build a four bedroom brick home. They're not yeah. necessarily building it to what you want, how you, how you need it, what it actually was before. They're just going to give you just the carpet standard build it. Like it, they don't have to worry about doing the exact like for like. So, so, I mean, we've got a huge growing portion of multi-dwellings, townhouses, apartments, et cetera, and, you know, yeah. less and less detached homes as a percentage every year. Yeah. Are these issues just as prevalent in that space? You know, when you buy into a strata building, you know, you check that you know the strata's got the insurance, but not many people would go and say, is that enough for the building? Yeah. You know, are these problems even worse or, or slightly better? Yeah, uh, there would be an argument. I haven't got the exact data on that, but the the argument that we hear back from brokers is that it's potentially worse because what you have in that scenario, yes, it's mandated that they need to get it done, so that's yep. great that it's mandatory that they have to have it. But the issue you have there is, is that you, in you know, say a unit block of 50 people, also then have 50 people's opinions on what they believe <laughs> it should be insured for. So, yes, you get an independent person, but that then needs to be voted at an AGM. People need to agree on it. Uh, you then have a mix of owner-occupiers and investors, who people who want to spend money on something and they don't. Um, yeah. So, you know, there, there is a real issue with that. Uh, and, you know, we've only seen in recent years Opal Tower and Mascot Tower and, and the defects that come in these buildings that, you know, you need, it's not just in that event going to be, you know, a, a storm uh, coverage. You, you know, you could be looking at, you know, defects or whatever it might be in a building or fire systems failing or waterproofing failing that you'd be calling on your insurance other than just, you know, for those storm events on a house. So you're saying that um, mascot towers, and I'm, I'm, I'm presuming you don't, you're not, privy to actually the terms of their insurance policy. But are you saying that potentially a defect like that that occurred 12 years after the construction was done um, could be covered by insurance? 
well, there's a, that, that's that's the big argument that's going on at the moment of whether the insurance company is going to cover it because they, they would be fighting that it may have been malpracticed by someone, um, whether it be yeah. you know, engineering or building. Those people don't exist anymore. Um, you know, so you know, there, are, there are plenty of horror stories of, you know, if we're going to beat up on insurance today that, um, you know, if they can get out of it, they will, which mm. is probably a little bit unfair in that instance but you know yeah. if, if they if they don't have to pay out a, and be liable to replace a whole building because someone has done something you know at fault well why wouldn't you be yeah, getting course. that but the problem would be that is that party you know is that beneficial to the owner because that party would could just declare bankruptcy and you're still at a loss of not having anything to replace well, that's the thing, isn't it? Look, I mean, back to how apartment buildings and, and strata um, buildings insure, you know, I read so many strata reports and basically one of the things I look at is, okay, is insurance current and and what are they, what's the building insured for? Uh, when's the most recent valuation and, you know, have they increased it since then? Um, how often do they get it done, et cetera, et cetera? And you're right, at AGMs, they vote whether they're going to get another valuation or not. And and even then the value is doing it, not a quantity surveyor. Yes. Um, and, and then, you know, if they increase it, it's a bit, you know, lick a finger and stick it in the air and go, oh, I don't know, is it CPI? What do we, what do we put it up by? You know, yeah. it's all very sort of arbitrary yeah. um, and very much hopeful, you know, and, um, and yeah, I, I, and even when we're looking at them, we think, well, we just got to hope the value knew what they were doing. Yeah, that's right. And you, you're putting your trust in, in other people in that instance and that's not necessarily always the best way to do it. I, I did a webinar recently with uh, – about 30 insurance brokers and I asked them when it comes to property insurance, um, wh- who do you, when, when an owner comes to you and says, oh, I've got a property, uh, I want to make sure it's insured properly, uh, what do you do? And we found there were five main buckets that uh, insurance brokers fell into and they sort of said um, use a value, use a quantity surveyor, use an online calculator, just add three or five percent CPI to last year's cover, or not my problem. Uh, based on you know, you've got to come up with that yourself. Yeah. Um, and and there's yeah. a broker. Like if you can't turn to your broker to get some more valuable information, there's yeah. something seriously wrong. Yeah, that's right. And you know, the the percentages in that didn't really fill you with much confidence. You know, it was oh, it's up to them. Uh, or you know a good portion of that was just adding three or five percent to the previous you know, sort of value. I mean, I, I had an instance where um, a fairly good friend of mine, a valuer, rang me the other day and left a voicemail on my phone, and um, I had to ring him back, and I've kept it because it just tickles my fancy. It, he said, um, "I'm just doing a report for someone uh, on a it was a big unit building, and they're after a replacement cost." Really not sure what I should be putting on that. Can you give me a bit of an idea of a cost per square metre so I can wrap it up? <laughs> now, you know, that that to me sort of says where we're at as an industry um, mm. and why we're at 83% under insurance. Uh, and I, I personally I can't blame the valuer here too much because the reality is what they're getting paid for yeah. by the mm. bank yeah. um, and the competition that they have to, hence why they have to charge so little, yeah. Um, is only allowing them to have so much time. And they've also got another appointment in 25 minutes that they need to get to um, yeah. to run a profitable business. And so the value, unfortunately, is, is it's got his hands tied because, you know, they're only, you know, they can't run a profitable business unless they do keep do it fast. Um, it comes back to our first point before that there's someone here that hasn't ticked the duty of care. You know, if a bank yeah. is driving someone's price down so much that that's what you're now getting, Where's the duty of care? So is the second part of that argument then from a financier's point of view that as long as the insurance cover covers what the payout is, that we're happy? So does that then mean if I buy a million-dollar house, yep. I pay it down for 10 years and it's now only worth 500 that I have to pay the bank out, if I provide them with an insurance policy that covers 500 which is inadequately insured, that they're happy because if it burns down their components covered you know? at, so what, they're only... at what point do we are we <laughs> really trying to fix under insurance if we're still at 83 percent there must be scenarios like this happening i'm sure there are 
If you like what you're hearing here, please share this episode with others you feel would benefit. And while you're at it, why not leave us an iTunes review? Five stars, please. Every review helps make it easier for other people to find us and hear what our amazing guests have to say. We love hearing your questions and we're planning more listener Q&A episodes. Please send your questions in. You can send them via the website, which is theelephantintheroom.com.au or directly via email to questions at theelephantintheroom.com.au. As we're talking, in all reality, this is this is not just in this area of sort of real estate or property. It's in so many different aspects exactly. of buying yeah. property, owning property. It is all about this, I don't get paid enough to properly advise you so I, and also I'm liable to get sued so I won't advise you. Mm. Um, I'll give you some useless little tidbit of information or direction and then disclaim my way out of it to go, it's all on you. Yeah. You know, this is endemic and yet property is our single biggest asset class in this country. Yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm sitting here just scratching my head and, I, I mean, look, there's a bit of a tangent. What's the resi prop- property market? $6.7 trillion? It was $7 trillion, oh. then it went bound down a bit, then it went up a bit. It's probably more now because, seriously, prices are going through the roof again, like, courtesy of so low interest 80, rates. 83% of a $7 trillion market is underinsured? And it's not just, uh, you know, your building insurance, right? It's also life insurance and all other insurances, but... I guess it's, uh, you know, the government's always, I guess, uh, not wanting to regulate. Um, but, you know, should we just be putting this back onto the individual and just saying, look, if you should be just doing what you need to do because you shouldn't rely on the government to, to take control of this issue? I think that um, you've hit the nail on the head from my point of view. And to give you an example, if, if you want to fix the solar industry in Australia and you want to make sure that, you know, we're, we're all doing our bit, then you make it mandatory that every new house has to have a solar hot water system. You just make it mandatory. And that mm. takes the competition out of it, right, because you're not trying to get someone to get a leg over on yeah, someone else sure. in regards yeah. to that. So, you know, if you want to fix insurance and you just make it absolutely mandatory, you have to have it independently assessed. Mm. But then are there enough independent assessors out there to do the job because well, this is does, that, like, if you that, build it they will come i guess you know i mean they, yeah, but it, flows in, up off it. it flows in and this is complicated because of course it flows into the next thing which is basically you know you've got um underqualified people then assessing yeah. and giving advice you know what i mean so it, it's it's complicated <laughs> yes it is and that's when you come back to what you're saying before that then you have competition where you have a pop-up that is driving the price down or mm. and suddenly you know it's going to bring those different, you know, sort of people out of the woodwork. You know, you see that with, you know, when the, the government of the day said, let's do the whole insur- roof insurance scheme and suddenly you had people jumping up that weren't qualified going in and getting killed. Yeah. So it definitely happens when you do big rollouts like that. But Yeah, crazy industries. I just, you know, there's an argument. Jump in, you know, yeah, that, that's yeah. a problem too. <laughs> yeah, but I just don't know whether people have really rationally sat down mm. and sort of thought, you know, everyone likes a tap on the shoulder, but do I really want to get a tap on the shoulder from an insurance company while I'm still watching the smoke rise off my property saying, by the way, you're going to have to chip in 200, you're short. It's, it's a really good point because we um, we refer our clients to a general insurance broker for, for home and contents um, insurance and they go to the market and figure out who they use. I've never actually put two and two together, which uh, is definitely a big learning for me here is to to really check how they're helping clients figure out what to insure for. Yeah. Mm. Now, and if they even offer to our clients um, to get it independently assessed with a surveyor, that's something one of my takeaways and, and is going to be encourage clients to, to, you know, pay $600, even if it's, you know, that they think that it's around the right mark. What's $600 when you could be talking hundreds and hundreds of thousands of dollars that, you know, just to, you know, they can basically destroy their financial future. So yeah. I think that's the big takeaway on this for our listeners. It, you know, pay your $600. It's not, not just through Marty's business, but any no, sort of one to surveyors out there. Invest invest in your investment. Yeah, exactly. I mean, on a different tangent, you know, putting that side of the conversation to bed, you know, obviously there's been lots of issues pop up with buildings. You mentioned Opal Tower and Mascot before, but you know, there's also been flammable cladding issues and, Buildings light up in Melbourne, for example. 
yeah. how prolific are these problems from your understanding? And uh, so sort of how's, what, how's, what's the solutions, I guess? Yeah, it comes back to our discussion before about valuers, right? Everything is about competition. So if someone can build something cheaper or quicker, they're going to find a way to leverage over their competition and be able to put their point of difference forward when they're going for a tender. So they've got to set themselves apart somewhere. So we're always seeing that with new building materials. And I guess that's where we, you know, we got to with the aluminium composite cladding that, you know, someone was building in, you know, previous building materials that were a bit slower and a bit more heavier and cumbersome that now suddenly, you know, they could use a a quicker product. Uh, It looked just as good and it met the requirements. So you suddenly now see a different product to hit the market. And then, like anything, people need to catch up and compete. So suddenly a lot of buildings were being built with it. And it, it kind of got away from people that, you know, was it really the right product? Was it fit for purpose? And apparently and absolutely we've been found wanting in it that it it isn't uh, a superior product and we've got big flammable issues on buildings. Do you think people knew about this when they were putting these on the buildings? Um, you know, there's a lot of oil companies and known issues, smoking, you know, it goes on like there's a always sometimes people know about the truth before they uh, it comes out into the mainstream. So do you think that the, the building industry was aware of flammable cladding issues as they were putting it on buildings? Look, I think there's an argument to say that they, they must have or because you would have to have had the product had to have been assessed to meet the building code of Australia um, and I just don't think that all the checks and balances were done and I, I think people were putting this up knowing that it, it wasn't suitable. I mean, the, there's been analysis um, from RMIT University that, have developed a combustibility ratio on the cladding and compared it to other products. And, you know, when you talk about the polyurethane sandwich panel, which is you know, an aluminium face, a, a polyurethane sandwiched in the middle of another um, rear aluminium panel, so that, that, that's what makes up the sandwich panel. Um, you know, when they, when they did the testing on that from a, the combustibility ratio, uh, they compared that to, say, timber cladding, which had a, combustibility ratio of three now that ratio is um how they work out um you know it's actually a ratio calculated by the amount of heat released from the burning material by the amount needed to ignite something so when they looked at timber cladding it had a ratio of three when they assessed the sandwich panel it was 25 (laughs) wow which just Mm. basically meant that when it gets hot so why it spread so dramatically and so quickly, which we saw in London in the Grenfell Tower, is that when you have, say, timber on a building, it tends to burn in the direction of wind uh, or a direction you know, up, whereas with the cladding, it melts, so it drips down. And because it's had a combustibility ratio of 25 times, so it heats up 25 times greater than it needs to ignite itself, just by mm. like hot dripping down, ignites. So it went up with wind in the cavity. It lights below because it drips down and it goes sideways because the aluminium front and back heat up to 25 times what it takes to ignite the middle. So it just ignites. Oh, it's kind of like little bonfires, really, when you yes. think about it like that, all over the city that um, are just waiting to sort of get lit up. But, yep. you know, and we're all just crossing our fingers and well, hoping yeah, that yeah, it doesn't happen, the, really. The, the Victorian government sort of was looking at a $600 million package and they were saying there was 500 buildings that needed they were going to be replacing. Um, and and, it, and it, within a four-month period to, you know, the, well, about the 5th of July of that year, they had already, um, the task force had went out to audit these buildings and already had a list of, you know, 2,200-odd buildings and the government was going to be replacing 500 of them. Mm. Um, so, you know, and of that 2,200 buildings that had the flammable cladding in it, nearly 900, it was about 860-odd of those buildings were actually classified at moderate to high risk. And this was going, to, this is going to be the, mil, uh, in the, you know, the billions to replace yeah. 600 million. 
Is there still materials that pit builders are using today that, I mean, might not be using flammable clubbing or asbestos or other things, but, you know, from your understanding, is there sort of materials that, you know, builders are still using today? Maybe it's wiring, maybe it's, I don't know. Yeah, there, uh, def- there definitely is, and it's happening all the time. So there are different papers that come out, you know, each month or each year that sort of outline, you know, issues. Last year there was electrical wiring where, um, yeah. There was a lot of homes had to be rewired because they were found yeah. that um, the insulation on the wiring was I think it was like imported. Um, yeah. That it, mm. and, and that would have been a cost cutting exercise. You know, I can buy my wiring from Australia that meets all the requirements and is, for all intensive purposes, pretty bulletproof. Um, and that is five dollars a linear meter. Well, no, no, no. I'll just get it from China or somewhere else that is far less. And I'm now still competing at the same price point, but my overhead is a lot less. So, you know, it's and what happens? You've then got the reworks. Mm. Well, then this is an enormous amount of trust too, because let's face it: if you get a property renovated or built, you're trusting that that builder is actually choosing, or developer or whoever is actually choosing the right materials aren't you? Yeah, yeah, but what, what you walk past, you accept. So as a consumer, we do that to ourselves too because we then mm. try and screw the sparky down and say, hey, you know, my other quote was half of what yours yeah, was. Yeah, it's so true. And then we go with that cheaper version. I mean, we've, we've done it. We're doing it to ourselves all the time. Mm. But it's also, it, yes, we do it to ourselves, but it's the uneducated consumer, isn't it? Yes. It's, the idea of being price driven, it's a, the idea of not being properly informed uh, as to really what you are choosing. And yep. this is rife, as I said earlier. I mean, you know, <laughs> it's, <laughs> it, it's rife across, well, throughout property in various guises, various aspects of it. Yep. Um, just sort of on that sort of insur- another thing that I wanted to ask you about on the insurance side of things as well, I know this is sort of into defects, um, but Buildings depreciate, right? Yes. So it sort of feels a bit weird that, you know, there's one way of thinking about, you know, the land, the value is in the land and the the building depreciates and you can actually get tax deductions on the depreciation of it, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But yeah. if it all burnt down, you, you don't want to be insuring it for the depreciated value because then you won't be able to replace it. Correct. So therefore you have to think with two different ways or two different lenses in terms of what buildings cost to build, yeah. then then you get, you know, and, and, and Chris t- t- touched on it before, was saying, you know, can you over-insure so you can, you know, potentially replace it with a better building, which is sort of um, – cool idea i guess but especially if the cost isn't so massive but in that instance you wouldn't get the extra <laughs> money i mean you'd have to upgrade but yeah you, you wouldn't be you couldn't go and build a 10 story or 10 bedroom home if you had insured it as a four bedroom home <laughs> no but if say i had a you know a, a modest um clad building and yes. i decided i wanted to have actually a, an architect designed concrete yes <laughs> bunker built instead yeah. you know could you feasibly, which is also four bedrooms, you know, could you feasibly do that? Yeah, you feasibly could and, and potentially also make a current affair, um, which would be <laughs> wonderful. But, yeah, yeah, I mean, that would just come out in the auditing purposes, I guess, um, and scenarios that they would do. But, yeah, the reality is, yes, you can. But And then, and then sort of applying the sort of same sort of thinking in a way to build defects and build quality of new property and what we walk past and what we um, what we demand is that, you know, fundamentally we are all trying to screw down the cost of everything. Yeah. And so then we are our own worst enemy, right? And yeah. so in an apartment building, if you aren't paying for that quality, the different design, the different materials, the workmanship, the actual, you know, there's a premium involved in that. Are you potentially setting yourself up for worse, for bigger problems in in the defects area? I mean, do they go? Out? Is there a correlation? Yes, and you you nailed it when you said setting. You know, are you setting yourself up for failure? Because for me, you know, the word setting setting you up is at the start of a job. And Deakin University and Griffith University did a joint report on defects in buildings in residential buildings. And they found that 50 to 60% of all building defects were attributed to the design stage. So people were cutting corners at the design stage. So you're setting yourself up for failure later on. So that that's, I guess, also a sign of the fact that a lot of people will get a, 
you know, the bare minimum from plans done from their architect. Well, we only need, council only need X amount for this to be approved or whatever it might be. And so, and they're not p wanting to pay an architect 40 grand. They want to, oh, no, I can get it done cheaper elsewhere for 30. So suddenly you're not getting the same quantum and detail on the plans. Now, the report clearly indicated that up to 50 to 60% of all defects would have been fixed in the design stage if it was better designed in regards to having that stuff documented. That's what's going to be one of my questions, Marty. You kind of hit a lot of the people do put the blame on the builders, right? Um, yeah. You're always in the construction company, but from what I read of one of your blogs, actually, that um, sort of lifted the valve for me and said, look, a lot of the issues potentially a poor design and it's maybe the architect that hasn't thought through some of the challenges to build it and then the issues that potentially could be with defects is is that sort of what you're saying there yeah because people and it may not just be the architect hasn't thought of it it could also be their scope that oh hang on a minute you're going to be too dear just do the mm. bare minimum or you are too dear i'm going to go with a draftsman so suddenly you're now going with a draftsman not an architect so um you know the detail isn't there. You've either tried to push them or pinch them uh, in regards to their fee structure or it's just an inability on the part of the architect to document it properly. But then there's also a growing movement in Australia and it has been for about 20 years that in the past when you employ an architect, his or her fee was encompassing of the construction program itself. So they were kept on for the whole job. So they would come out when there was a variation by a builder and say, well, no, that was documented on plan 494 or this is how you would do it. And, this, and they would redo little drawings and, and manage it. That cost money. So what did we do as a consumer? We went, we're not going to pay for that. We can manage that ourselves. There are uh, many, many buildings in Australia, residential homes, that the architect does up the plans. That's it. Hand the plans over to the builder and it's now the builder <laughs> to go away. Because, A, we've saved money. We don't need that architect. So yeah. they've never been able to do that additional drawing to help detail how that head beam should tie into the roof to avoid water. This is interesting, actually, because, well, for starters, we interviewed uh, Dr Nicole Johnston, who's one of the co-author co of that yes. report you mentioned earlier, and yeah. back in episode 113. So if you want to go back and, and hear that, listen to Nicole and explaining all about that whole report about defects, then please do so. On on the actual, you know, the 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 working together of an architect and a builder. Now, for starters, you know, if you're buying a project home, that that's not the way it works. You know, no. you're buying a project home, you're buying a package, and basically it's it's like a it's like a factory, it's like a manufacturing plant. Yeah. But if you are having an architect design your home, and I've I've had I've done three lots of renovations with architects, and it's been in, the experience has been different each time. And the one I'm in at the moment, for instance, I I didn't get my architect to manage the process, but that's partly because um, of the relationship I have with my builder, and also I know that my builder will will go to the architect, you know, throughout. But yeah. I did have water problems and um, which the builder has come back and we've worked through processes. But part of the reason that I had water problems is because the way at which the council regulations forced the house to be built um, meant that all the water and, and then, of course, we literally it was built and designed, designed and built in a drought and then yeah. and then El Nino broke literally a week before I moved in and then we sort of went, whoa, we've got to fix all this stuff. So, so and water will find that the, the course of least resistance, let's yes. face it. So it's been quite good actually just to get this house watertight. But big part of it was the sheer volume of water going into one small part of roof. Yep. And but that is and part and parcel, we go back to actually why it was designed that way. It was designed that way because council made certain requirements. Yeah, you know, and so it, you have to have this this ongoing fluid relationship, pardon the pun, with the architect and designer and the homeowner, and an understanding that this stuff isn't it isn't just built, designed and then built and then you've got a nice watertight house. No. That there are often things that have to be worked through in the actual execution of that building in function. Yeah. And we, you know, when I was building, we always loved a, a, a good rainfall event just after you'd done the roof or had just yes. done cladding because you can kind of find where your issues are. Mm. Uh, you know, when you're building in you know, perfect uh, conditions, sunny conditions, you don't get that um, that benefit, I guess. But that just also shows that, you know, council have put 
a change or a, a, a clause in there that you need to do a certain thing, probably for a, a height reason or a, um, you know, a, a distance from a fence or whatever it might be, mm-hmm. that you have to make that change, that is there a flow-on effect that, okay, or a duty of care that, okay, there's a change, architect, what are the ramifications of that change? Uh, do I now need to put a 150 mil round gutter on that bit or an extra mm. panel pipe or whatever it might be? Now, that may have just been an oversight and, and not known and, and that's where there are just on every construction job a lessons learned. Uh, you can't get it perfect all the time. But the reality is that you would hope that that's not an ongoing issue, that it is fixable, um, mm. that is, you know, with a bit of a return on investment that you don't want to pour a heap into it to never get back. But sometimes those littler issues are quite big across a whole apartment block for eight sake. Yeah, and it also comes back to the willingness of the builder to come back. Yeah. And so, you know, I didn't screw the screw the deal. I didn't leave not enough in it so that there's nothing in it for my builder to actually to make sure, and my builder's been fantastic. I've, I've, I've recommended it to loads of people be very much because of this. You know, there's yes. been, in any building, um, there's, there's going to be, you could, and it depends on your definition of defect as well. It, it's the willingness to come back. So, And I think what is important, though, what you're talking about, though, is that they do start at the design phase. If there's a problem there and you've got builders that just build without questioning and don't sort of challenge or go, oh, if you do this, you know what I mean? So it's a collaborative exercise yeah. in order to actually get it right because the builder has certain expertise that the architect doesn't, you know what I mean? So together it's 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 uh, getting the better outcome. But it's an approach too, right? So if, mm. if you were uh, looking to employ someone in your office, you might say to them in the interview, uh, take me through an example of how you problem solve something or how you manage conflict or whatever it might be. We don't seem to go through that same process when we're interviewing a builder. We've got three builders sitting in front of us. We've got three different tenders and we're saying, uh, who can do it? Oh, you can do it cheaper. Why can't you match their price? And we, yep. we, we fixate on cost, right? I ask builders, okay, take me through your defects on your last job. And they instantly put up a brick wall. Oh, we don't have defects. We're quality builders, blah, blah, blah. Like, yeah, okay. No worries. <laughs> we'll, we'll get past the, the chest puffing up exercise. And then we'll actually say, let's have a discussion about it. This is not a bad thing. You want to understand with your builder what are they? What's they going to be their approach when there is something that they don't quite agree with on the plan? You want to know that they're going to come to you. You, you don't want to. You don't yeah. want a builder that's just going to go. We don't have defects because guess what? Every job has a defect. If they're going to say they don't have defects, that's because they're glossing over it. Ah, oh, that could just put a panel up over that. No, no, no. Right? Mm, yeah. so exactly. You want to know? Yeah, you know. I, there's an argument to say I want to work with a builder that says I had so many defects on the last job. Now, if the reason is because the plans were inadequate and or whatever it might be, if it was a workmanship issue, well, that's an issue, right? But you would want to know that a builder is coming across these things and coming back and closing them out and it being amicable, you know, across you might you may not agree with it from a homeowner that's costing you more money, but you're probably getting a better job. So Marty, I guess uh Veronica and I may not agree on this one, but you know, I guess we're building better phones, we're building better cars, we're building better uh, lots of things, right? Do you think, though, we are going to be building better houses, apartments in the future or do you take the other view that ultimately there's way too many conflicts, it's about fast and furious, make a profit, get in, make your money like from a development point of view and ultimately if this was 2040 we'll be saying the exact same things but just a different version of them? (laughs) I think that there will always be different versions of things just because of trial and error and new things that come out but... As a consumer, we need to hold everything we do to account that if we want to get a quality product, then you have to understand there's a difference. Now, I know people will say to me, it's all about cost. It's all about cost. And I go, okay, what car do you drive? Oh, I drive a Mercedes. Okay, well, it's not all about cost, right? Because you could have bought a Hyundai. So it's all about cost that suits your priority. Now, if you aren't going to prioritise a building or a renovation that you're doing, then you're probably going to get the Hyundai outcome, right? Now, I'm not trying to throw them under the bus from a quality point of view, but from a, a standing in a marketplace, if if you're just going to accept the lowest amount, then you're kind of going to get the issues you come along with that. I think the industry 
will improve because people will demand it. I think there's a you're saying see buildings now, and you know, kudos to the the, the newer generation uh, that they're they're very green and and um, you know, and I'm talking about environment that they're wanting to see sustainable materials and they're wanting to see you know, sustainable buildings that are, are thermally better than just having a ducted aircon pumping along all the time. So I think that the industry will change. There will be some teething problems because there's going to be new products that we'll be using in 2040 that haven't even been thought of yet. Uh, you've only got to see the, you know, the, the expansion and growth of electrical products in buildings now than 40 years ago with, you know, CBUS used to be a big thing and it's kind of not even there anymore because it can all be built into individual products. Um, you know, being able to turn your front light on from kilometres away. So we're starting to see changes there that will need to come out uh, and be teethed out, but we need to work as a group, collaborate with, you know, a quantity surveyor, an architect and a builder. You need to get that roundtable going at design stage. Now, that yes, that comes at a cost, but you're going to be saving on defects and variations later on because you've had some collaboration at the start. It's the same as when you're buying an established property. If you had collaboration at the start, got good advice from all, you know, I say it's it takes a village to yep. buy a property and, and but the problem is we've got expensive property in this country yep. and where people cut the corners is on the advice. Yeah, you put, you'll get people who get a building in pest inspection and it'll come back that this property's got termites and they'll, the mentality and the vocabulary around, around that will be, I just wasted $600 on that house because I'm not going to buy <laughs> it. I kind of think you just saved a million dollars. Yeah, yeah. Unfortunately, and there's there's sort of behavioural biases around this as well, <laughs> that, 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 that you talk about setting us up. We set ourselves up, you know, yes. to basically get uh, get in situations that could be very, very expensive. Now, on that, do you have an example of a property Dumbo for us? Yeah. So one of the um, ones I wanted to sort of go through was when we get a lot of commercial properties uh, that come through uh, when it comes to replacement costs of buildings. So, you know, the, the main one that um, I wanted to sort of go through, I guess, was one that we did recently on a, uh, on a pub. Um, so we do a lot of hotels um, in in what we do. They tend to be a really common commercial job that we do. But this client had owned a, a pub for quite a while and the insurance broker who we were dealing with had been telling them to get an independent assessment done for many, many years and they sort of weren't interested. But so anyway, they finally convinced the owners that they need to get it assessed, if nothing else, to draw a line in the sand so that for the next 10 years they don't have to do anything. Um, and this was in uh, Collingwood in Melbourne, and the, the current insured value they had it for was four and a half million. So we got the plans, went to the on-site assessment, went through the whole property, had a massive big car park out the back, and uh, our assessment came back in that it should have been insured for nine point two million, including demolition, the cost escalations. There was a partially heritage uh, a heritage uh, component on the facade on one of the sides. Um, so yeah, our value came in at nine point two. So it was you know in near enough to double. So we, we presented the report back to the insurance broker who took it to the owner, and they their feedback after I was sort of speaking to them was they had decided to keep the insurance at the previous amount of four point five million, because the licensee that was in there, the tenant, had been in there for many years, was a really good guy and looked after the place, and they didn't want to put it up because it would affect his premium he'd have to pay a lot more. They want to upset the apple cart, so they were just happy to leave it as it was. Wow. I'm just happy to risk think, the building. Yeah. you're. And once again, there's a mindset that you sort of think, you know, hang on a minute, you're prepared to take, knowingly take that on, um, knowing that you're underinsured. And we see it in, in that same instance where they go, oh, okay, we'll just wait mm. it this year and then we'll do a little bit more next year. You're like, hang on, it's underinsured, just cover it. And we see that a lot with pubs because they tend to be in families for a long time, like in family groups or um, you know, trusts and they get handed down and inherited and, and the like. And, and if they're working from a benchmark that's a, you know, a long way that's been adding 3% to it each year, they're never going to get there in theory because their base was wrong to start with. <laughs> yeah. Yes. 
Oh, dear. That's, I find that interesting, though, no, that they're prepared to take a, basically a $5 million gamble. Yep. Mm. Yep. And the insurance broker at that point was had a duty of care that they had to also mention that to the, you know, the potential insurer they were going through. So there was going to be some disclaimers in that instance. So I'm sure that was going to come back to bite them from a probably not get insurance, knowing that there was a report that had already been done. But it was just the mindset, oh, no, I'm not going to worry about that. That's... You know, it won't happen. It won't happen. It won't happen. You have to be really unlucky it's, for that to happen. It's been here 60 years already and nothing's happened. Oh, dear. Oh, interesting, Dumbo. Mm. Well, Marty, thank you for that chat. I mean, it's alarming, actually, and, and very disconcerting, a lot of the things that we just talked about. You know, I'm going to go mull over a bit, actually, to see how we can, you know, advise our clients, particularly on when they're buying a house and they're, um, mm. they're after settlement, it's, you know, because we do get asked that a lot, you know, how do – what do we do? And and I think that recommending that they get a quantity surveyor to do a report, I think, is a great step to do to give them that that peace of mind. Yeah, it's just putting it into perspective. I mean, we know people that spend more on car polish for their car than they do a depreciation schedule that gets them money back. <laughs> It's, it's all that's that human, Marty. <laughs> well, if it's an investment property, you can use it as a tax deduction. Of yeah, course, but, um, yeah, yeah, yeah. And I guess the other real thing is is the issues with uh, cladding and building issues in apartments, which all our listeners would have, you know, heard enough of on 160 odd episodes. But you know, those issues aren't going away. They might have been off the front pages for a while, but they're, they're still around those apartment blocks. They're still getting built. There's still issues there. So just be super careful if you're going anywhere near these or you own them because, um, yeah, it won't be long until they're back on the front pages, I imagine. Yeah, and there are some people that are really struggling in apartment blocks to get insurance on that because insurance, now they Absolutely. know that they've got flammable cladding, have that as an exclusion. So they'll say, yeah, we'll cover you, but if it's because of the cladding, that's an exclusion. So... Are you, how are you really covered? You know, in, so there is an effect and a mindset that needs to change. People need to be aware of these things. Yeah. No more ostriches. No. <laughs> Said on the elephant in the room. Thanks again, Marty. Thanks so much for having me. Awesome. Thanks, Marty. We want to make you a better elephant rider. And this week's elephant rider training is... You know, one thing that really came to my mind when Marty was talking, particularly the latter end of that interview, was around the shortcuts that people take when it comes to property decisions. And it's it's really mind-blowing. We all do it, you know, we all do it. But it's mind-boggling when you think about the amount of money that we borrow to buy a property, the amount of our own personal wealth that is, is bound up with property, the fact that we live in our homes and then what, where would we live if we didn't have a home, you know, these these are major major decisions, both financially and sort of mental health wise. You know? Yeah. And yet we take so many shortcuts. And so currently, you know, we are beginning of twenty twenty one auction clearance rates. You know, I, I read the paper today, so we're we're recording this in February, and read the paper today to say that the clearance rates highest in twenty five years. You know, and and close to ninety percent, and it's. When the market is like that and FOMO is at its absolute greatest and I've had I've heard and seen messages from agents basically gloating that yeah, this is FOMO at its best and they're, they're loving it, right? It's so easy to sell anything pretty much at the moment. Yeah. And this is when people take shortcuts. You know, this is when, um, you know, obviously when you're insuring it's after you bought the property but even in the actual due diligence before you're buying the property, it it you can't take shortcuts and I know someone else is probably going to race you and buy that property before you can actually get your due diligence done you know but the reality is that you you know was it uh, you act in haste and repent at, le- at leisure we have to be careful and extra careful when you've got FOMO going on and when you are under more pressure because of the rising prices and the general sort of frenzy that's out there in the marketplace and i i know that even though i say this I know that most people still won't slow down and take their time and be careful, but I just have to say it anyway. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's what we're saying. I drove past an open home um, on Saturday just in the beaches and uh, it was actually on a really poor road and the line out the door, I reckon it was at least 50 long and this was not a great asset, you know. It's a mm. really, really busy road 
and you know car quite tight as well so it's all cars are flying past each mm. other um really narrow road but busy and um i was just astounded with how big this queue was and it was like quarter to 12 or so i was and i drove past it again because i was like i just want to see you know because we had to go back past it and i was wanting to see how bad it is and the queue was still long after 12 o'clock after it opened so i was just you know when it's like that when poor assets have just got huge yeah. queues it's really a sign that people are super desperate because that's why they're going and looking at this property. Mm. They don't want it. They just have, feel like that's their only option. Um, yep. I was super pleased for a client last week actually where they were in love with the property. You know, I was up in the Central Coast and I've been looking for a little bit but not too long and this is why I think they, they were able to walk away. But they got a building and pest done. They realised that quite a lot of things to the house were done without council approval and big things, um, you know, balconies and all these sort of things and you know, and they, they had to convince themselves not to buy it. And they were completely in love with the property. A little bit of desperation because the market's super hot where they were buying as well. And they walked away. That property sold for a big price at auction. And so whoever bought it just didn't care and just didn't even want to, uh, even didn't do the due diligence or just, you know, just put their head in the sand. So mm. you're 100% right, Veronica. And the problem is the client thinks, well, you know, if they do it, I should have just done it. Um, you know, if they're willing to take that risk, shouldn't I take that risk? Yeah. Uh, and no, you don't. You don't need to to take those risks. Just keep looking, do your due diligence, uh, and, and just be patient, even though it's the hard thing to do. Well, here's the other thing that buyers often do in those circumstances, and I, I remember this when I was a selling agent. Right, you get the you get your enthusiastic buyer who hasn't been in the market that long, and they do a building inspection, they don't buy that one. They do another building pest inspection, they don't buy that one. They do another one, they don't buy that one. Then finally, go, oh bugger it, what's the point? I'm just wasting money on building pest inspections. I'm just going to turn up and bid. That's what obviously. Someone else has obviously done it. You know, if, if other if other people are bidding, somebody there must have done it, so it must be all right. So yeah. they're effectively deferring the responsibility or, or basically saying, well, they've done it and I'm just going to abdicate my responsibility and just hope to hell that that person knows what they're doing or did or did do due diligence. And, uh, it, but, and this is, you know, very what you would think would be savvy, smart, successful people making these crazy outlandish assumptions um, that they then get lumbered with if they're the ones that actually buy that property. So I tell you what, honestly, in the last couple of weeks, the amount of Dumbo things I have seen and heard of buyers doing, we could do an extra Dumbo episode a week, I reckon, at the moment because yeah. there is, honest to God, I'm, I'm flabbergasted by how stupid some people are when they're buying property. It just is blowing my mind. Yeah, and we've been really big advocates on, you know, the off the plan sort of awareness around that. Um, but what we will start to see now is people will be forced to go back to new developments because it's easy to buy. Mm. You've got this real pain in the market um, and that will give people an option. And this is where the development sort of off the plan start to really flourish. Um, yeah. And also the market's rising so people are going, well, I'm willing to take that gamble that it's going to be worth more when it's, you know, fully built. Uh, built. Um, and so they, they're attaching what's happening in the family housing market to what's happening in the new townhouses or new apartments. And they're completely different markets um, with completely different um, sort of end result, I imagine, in a couple of years. So mm. just be really careful. Don't fall for that off the plan at the moment because even though you've got pain, that is not the solution. Well, actually, just sort of quickly on that, you know, I know someone who very recently sold an apartment, you know, two bedroom, two bathroom, one one parking uh, apartment, you know, very nice apartment in a building that's uh, I think seven or eight years old that, um, that is in an area where there is massive oversupply, particularly exacerbated now through COVID, but also more stock coming on. Right. And so this person sold this property. Um, they bought it in the peak of the market, basically 2017. Um, and, you know, so for a very small loss. Right. And they realized the mistake that they'd made buying that property and, and got out and, and took the hit. And that's a hard thing to do because nobody wants to feel that um, sense, that loss aversion. You know what I mean? We have that, that uh, we do not want to feel that loss and we don't want to accept that we made bad decisions. And, and so that person, um, you know, yeah, it's not really pleasant, but you know, they've made the, the smart decision for the long term. And there's other properties in the building. There's a, a one bedroom apartment in the building with no parking, but with quite a good size courtyard. And that sold recently for roughly $200,000 less than the two bedroom apartment. And, you know, and the people in the building, 
that person made money and they made money only because they bought off the plan in 2012. But they made in eight yeah. years 40% gain. Now, that is not a huge gain, particularly when they had an entire property boom in there where many other people doubled yeah. their money. Yeah. So they're all running around thinking, you know, paying themselves on the back for making good decisions. And I'm like, you actually didn't make a good decision. You lucked it that it could have been worse because your timing wasn't as bad as that other person just sold. But you, you know, there's no relativity there. Nobody's sitting down there actually working out, or oh, what was the opportunity cost? You know, what really was a percentage return? They just see the dollars. They just see that, oh, I made $200,000 or whatever they made. Um, that means I, I did well, but that actually didn't. And and this is this is the danger, you know, and and too many property, and and once again, you know, the very fact you can own a property, or you could it was what they paid five hundred thousand or something back in two thousand twelve, you know, you you've got to be earning, you got to be on a pretty good wicket and have a good job to be able to borrow that amount of money. You know, these aren't silly people. It's just that when you put them, in, you know, in a property situation, there's very little analytical thought and understanding of really the drivers and really what's going on and really what's a good decision and what's not. Yeah, very true. Please join us for our next episode when we're talking all about commercial property. It's known to be riskier than residential property, but why is that? The sector spans retail, industrial office space, you know, from small shops to office blocks, industrial units. How does the average investor even know where to start? We'll be joined by Steve Polise. He's the author of a book called Commercial Property Investing Explained Simply. And he's going to explain a lot of things very simply for us. Please join us. If you're looking to buy your dream home or an investment property, in Sydney's inner west, eastern suburbs or North Shore, my team and I can help you buy without regrets. Reach out via my website, gooddeeds.com.au. If you're looking to buy your first home, thinking of upgrading into a new one or purchasing an investment property anywhere in Australia, my team love to carefully guide you on this journey and most importantly, get the finance right. Reach out via our website, wealthful.com.au. Thanks for joining us. We'd love to see you again. And remember... Don't be a dumbo.